Well, um, yeah, as you know, my name is Terry Davenport. My company is called Natural House Builders, Inc. And uh, I'm a third generation carpenter. Uh, my grandfather was a builder and so was my dad. And uh, I worked with my father to make money to, to afford my expensive uh, motocross racing sport uh, when I was a kid. And I didn't care about houses, so I just cared about making the money. So I got married, went to Seattle, and basically saw homes built as art, big plywood palaces, as sometimes we call them, <laughs> and fell in love with uh, the way of building uh, that's artistic. So I came back to Montana and built a real beautiful house for myself. And, and you know, as a kid, I loved to improve my motorcycle. Uh, at that time, during racing motocross, there was a big suspension revolution going on, and the bikes are really improving technologically. So I took that passion with me when I stopped racing motor motocross and went into houses. And I've never looked back since. And it's brought me to like the, the pinnacle of building. And now that I'm at the pinnacle, which I would consider this German building standard called Passive House. How many of you guys have heard of Passive House standard? Yeah, quite a few, quite a few, yeah. It's gotten a lot more popular. Uh, so, Passive House is a very strict standard uh, uh, by a couple guys. I think Wolfgang Feist visited uh, Amory Levin's, I think I got the story right, but Amory was talking about these uh, solar houses we used to build, you know, back in the 70s, where uh, a bunch of people got together and put a lot of glass in the south, you know, and these passive envelopes. And Wolfgang decided to go back to Germany and write, write his thesis on it. And the Germans, being who they are, they put numbers to it and started looking at it from an energy efficient point of view and made this modeling program you can buy for 200 bucks. And you can basically model a house before you build it and understand how big to put, how big of a glass area to do, how much insulation you need in the walls and stuff. And so when I heard about this, I just fell in love with this program. That's called the yeah, yeah, uh, PHPP. And you guys can Google this and stuff. And so uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's very industrial. It's not going out in the woods and chopping down a tree and building a, a nice log cabin out of it. And it. But what they're looking at in Germany, they're looking at uh, global warming. And so they're looking at their carbon footprint. And it's basically a program to reduce carbon. And uh, so I get this client. Sydney calls me up and says, hey, Terry, I want a net zero energy house. Can you do one of those? And so I'm thinking, yeah, I can, I can probably build one of these houses. You know, all we have to do is put, you know, a whole field full of solar PV and we can net zero anything out, you know. But what you have to do is you have to ma basically make the load right, of the building, which is the heat, cooking, uh, air conditioning. No, just joking. <laughs> no air conditioning allowed. In fact, I was told that the Austrians would, would uh, shun you on the street if they heard you're using air conditioning in Europe. Yeah, so they, they think different than us. You know, when they pull up to a stop sign, they shut off their engine. You know, I, I try that in Missoula and everybody's looking like, what's wrong with this guy's car? Just shut off, you know. So, so their, their uh, country actually spent a lot of money uh, to educate them, which is uh, pretty cool. I, I hope our country can do that better. But, uh, so anyway, Passive House is a strict standard and uh, it's basically, uh, very difficult to meet. So Sydney wanted to run his house through Passive House, and I've got the data from uh, Energetics. Have you guys heard of Energetics and the uh, Russ Helms company? And uh, and obviously it, it didn't uh, didn't meet it by quite a ways. And one of the things about Passive House, you have to uh, build a certain structure. You just can't build like a log cabin with a loft. The loft killed us because what it is, it's it's a it's a, a ratio of exterior surface to square foot area. And this ratio has to be, uh, where is the ratio here? I think it's, uh, I don't remember, it's somewhere written down here. I think it's a three, yeah, a ratio under three to achieve it. And Sydney's was 3.8 as I, as I designed his house. And uh, Sydney was kind of disappointed because he thought it was going to meet the standard. And this program was done with some very, very expensive windows from Poland that cost $4,800 to ship here. Yeah. And now, also about Passive House, you know, uh, when Wolfgang talked to, to uh, Amory, they wanted to do this really simple. They wanted to keep the houses real simple, right? Well, they took this back to Germany, and the Germans say, oh, no, we've got to make it more efficient, you know. So what they did, they, they invented these machines called uh, HVAC towers. And it looks like a refrigerator. And in this little refrigerator, 
They've got like a, a solar vessel to hold the, the solar heat, to store solar heat. You've also got a, a heat recovery ventilator. That's a ventilation machine that, that uh, basically takes the warm, stale air uh, and, and exchanges it with the cold, incoming fresh air, and it, and it transfers the heat uh, into the building that way. And then they put a uh, compressor on the outgoing air of that and uh, put a bunch of temperature sensors. So the temperature sensors are looking for, for who's got the energy. Maybe the sun has the energy that day. If the sun doesn't have the energy, they, they scrub off the heat from the outgoing air. And if that doesn't have the heat, there's a little electric strip heater in there that turns on. Well, I wanted to import one of these things, right? Uh, and uh, to buy one in euros was 10,500 euros. And, you know, I look at the owner's manual of this thing, it's like 100 pages long. And I think back to Amory, you know, uh, yeah, this, these things are going to be really simple buildings. I think to myself, this thing ever breaks down, there's no way I'm going to be able to fix this thing. And so I never, never went there. So my point being was passive house. I think they're kind of a little out of control. They're getting too complex. And in order to meet the standard, you have to basically uh, use their windows from uh, Europe. The North American windows are, are not uh, good because what we did, we looked at our windows as from a, uh, a viewpoint where we want to have super energy efficient, right? And energy efficient to a North American was like not letting energy, any energy you know, out of the building. So tri-pane windows with lots of low E coatings. Uh, low emissivity glasses, it reflects the heat one way or another. So it keeps the heat in the building. Well, what they forgot about was that we also like to have solar gain. And uh, the Germans didn't think that way, though. They wanted to make these passive houses work. So their solar heat gain coefficients are about 60%, and ours are only about 20% or less. And so you can't buy a window in North America that compares to a window in Europe. Uh, the only way to do it is to import them. And I think it's basically because polit uh, politicians were making our, our laws for energy efficient standards and not, not billion scientists or, or window people. Uh, so it's difficult to, to meet the standard, uh, but I discovered something. Uh, I, I heard that these guys in Bozeman, uh, radio engineering, were building houses and uh, not, not building houses, but supplying houses with uh, uh, solar collectors on the roof, right? And doing solar active, pumping the glycol down to a solar st storage tank, and then taking that energy and pump it through the floor at nighttime. And I thought, that's cool, man, because we can use the sun for heating houses. And so I, after about the fourth house I did, I finally got the, the system down to where I got it fairly simple. And this is a lot, a lot of complex stuff. It looks like a submarine when you look at the wall, you know. And most people are overwhelmed when they see it, but I, I just tell them, we have to break it down in sections. You know, like this is the solar loop and this is the, the heat distribution loop. So I got the data back after monitoring that for like four years uh, of winters. And uh, it beat Passive House by 31%. Yeah, and I was excited because I don't have to buy these expensive windows now. And, and, uh, and I was really happy about that. Uh, but now I'm thinking, you know, even beyond that, that, that solar system actually cost, uh, you know, about 17 grand to install. And I can't afford one. And very few people can afford one. So I'm thinking, okay, what's, what's the difference between those two? Right. Right. Yeah, basically you've got a, a, a solar storage tank. You've got collectors on the roof. This would be an active. Obviously, you've got to have the sun shine on this. And, and this thing gets hot. I mean, if you want to see the power of the sun, uh, go there on a hot day and touch the pipe. Don't touch the pipe. It's going to be like 200 degrees. And, and these things will go up to like 260 degrees uh, because they're pressurized glycol. It's not a good idea to do that because it's hard on the glycol. So you have a coil in the bottom of the tank. Did I draw this right? So I don't know. Anyway, one's, one supply. This would probably be a supply. Well, yeah, it can get really complex. Two tanks is more efficient. And I'll explain why two tanks is more efficient. So this would be like maybe your main water heater with, with electric element. If you're, okay, if you're an older person and you want to have always at 72, then you probably want to do the tank. But if you're younger and you can, you know, you can handle a temperature swing, 
uh, the coldest Walden's house gets down to is about 58 with the heat shut off because I've got so much insulation in the walls. So then you can just run solar only. Uh, and that's one reason why I'm being the passive house standard. So the reason why this tank is more efficient to run two tanks, I should say, is because if we put the element in this one, this tank would have to be set to 120 to use it for domestic hot water. And I should back up because I'm basically using the domestic hot water to store heat energy. And then I pull off that water for domestic hot water and also for space heating. Like it can be sent out to radiant flow pipes. So if this is set to 120, so you don't take a cold shower, or 115, that means the solar collector has to get up to 120 before you can put any, any energy in here, right? But if this tank over here is at 120, and say this one coasts down to maybe, maybe 75 degrees, then when this thing gets above 75, it can start producing energy into this tank. And then you can temper, you can send this into the other tank. So you're kind of tempering this. And so these uh, solar thermal system, combi systems get really complex. And, uh, and they can really get out of control too. They, they start adding, you know, uh, wood fired uh, boilers to them. And, and, you know, pretty soon they got these huge tanks. Uh, and, and a tank, a stainless steel tank like this, $3,000, 120 gallons, not cheap. And anyway, they can, they, getting back to the large, larger tanks, they'll put multiple coils in them, right? And, and you know, this, this may be for adding heat from the, from the, uh, the gas boiler. This one might be adding heat from, from something else. This might be taking heat out to some other place. But some people love this. I mean, some guys have the money and they have nothing else to do with it. So they, they have us build these things. But the sun is so powerful, I tell you guys, that there was a guy, my plumber, uh, Mark, uh, what's his last name? New Era Plumber. Uh, New, New Era Plumbing. I can't remember his, his last name for some reason. Mental block, sorry. There was a house built with, with a big tank underneath the floor, full of water, right? And so Mark put a solar collector on the roof, a bunch of them. And he's going to heat this up. It's never been fired up before. This guy bought this house as was. It had never been hooked up. So Mark hooks it up. And I don't know how many gallons is in here. Maybe 1,200 gallons. And he just lets it run during the summertime. And he comes back to the, to the house one day to, to take a look at it. And the water is boiling. He got it so hot. And when you boil that much water, that's a huge amount of energy. So one of the tricks to this is, if you can, and the guys in Vermont figure this out, you know. Radiant Tech, figure this out. What you do is you build a sand bed. Have, how many people have heard of these sand bed uh, under slab insulation systems? Anybody? A few? Okay, cool. So what you do, you, you put a whole bunch of sand under your house with radiant pipe back and forth. And then during the summertime, what you do, sun's out, you've got your collector, and you've got a pump. And these pumps don't use a lot of juice. We've got German pumps made by Grundfos called Alpha, and they use... I can pump like uh, three quarter gallon per minute at uh, 23 watts. And the 23 watts can move a huge amount of energy under this slab. So you heat this thing up during the summer. So you start heating this thing up maybe in, we don't know yet, We're, it's still so new for us Montana boys. But you heat this thing up under the house, maybe you start in August. And you get this sand real hot. And then winter time shows up, the floor is pretty warm. In fact, I've been told the guys in Vermont have done this. People are, are cooking. By September, they're too hot. They got their doors and windows open. But October comes along, November, they close up the doors and windows, and they coast into wintertime with this system. Pretty cool. Um, we haven't tried one yet. I, I developed one in a, in a strawberry house I worked on with Scott <coughs> and, uh, this summer, but, but the lady wasn't conducive to turn this up yet. But I try to build my buildings so I think of the future owners. You know, maybe someday some future owner will be down in the mechanic room and say, what is this, you know? You know, this, this big uh, sand bed loop, what is that? And then I'll start looking at it, it's like, holy cow, I can do this, you know? It'll get excited and, and this saves a huge amount of energy to do something like, like this. I don't know you saw your paper, I'm drawing kind of big. But there's another uh, wild man up in Alaska, his name is Thorsten Klupp. And Thorsten is the, the passive house guru probably of North America. And he's, he's, he's doing his house, passive house certification, and he's way up in uh, Fairbanks, I believe. A CLUPP, C-L-U-P-P. -P. And he, uh, he, he's, he's a real smart guy. 
I mean, he gives this presentation, and he never, he never cracks a smile during the whole presentation until the very end. But, but uh, he started through, and, and, and the trouble is, these passive houses look like a cardboard box. So if you want to live in a house that looks like a cardboard box, you'd probably be okay with it. But most of my clients don't like that. Uh, first, Thorson's house, see if I can draw this. He's, done a sort, he's got about 14, I think, sort of collectors all across the front of his house. And it's very uh, salt box looking, you know. Wait, where the back is angled down, and here would be the front. Here's the side wall. And his panels are dead vertical, 90 degrees. <clears throat> Whereas our solar collectors here, to do solar for, uh, you know, doing a combi system, you want about 60 degrees at this latitude. But what he's done, he's, <laughs> he found this fuel tank that wasn't ever used, and he put this huge fuel tank into his house, and then he, he built a room around the fuel tank, and to insulate it, you would think you'd wrap some foam around or something, right? Not, not Thorsten. He, he inside the whole room with cellulose. I mean, dumped the cellulose in the entire room. And so what he can do, he says he can run, and he's got a wood stove, right? He's got actually a, a, a masonry fireplace with a heat coil in this to this tank, to keep the tank. And he's also got the solar going to the tank. And he says he can run his hot water uh, for two hours and not run out of hot water. He also says, and this is in Fairbanks, so it's negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. He also told me in this video that uh, he can run two months <clears throat> without any supplemental heat. But one of the key things he did, though, took at the heat loss, he has these great big thermal shutters, that, like a big barn door. He slides across the front of his windows. And uh, so that's, that's Thor Thorsten's uh, system there. So I'm just glad I'm not living in this climate like this. I, I think he likes to climb mountains, and that's why he lives there. But, uh, but that's a pretty big temperature uh, difference when you're 70 in the house and negative 50 outside. So my idea, all these systems are complex and holy cow, let's build these houses and show up with a half a million dollars and we can do something for you, you know. Well, not everybody has $500,000 to put into a house. I don't put houses for the normal person, you know. So my idea is to, uh, do I have any paper left? Am I, I going to wear out your paper? No. <laughs> Good, thanks. Because uh, I draw big. My idea is to go backwards in time. 1972, 1971. So we're going to combine passive house with this active house. And we're also going to include a garden too. Because houses need, you know, people need to eat and we need to have gardens. And these guys are built, building these houses back in those days. And, and I'll draw this and I'll see what you guys, see if you guys can guess what this is. I'm sure a lot of you guys, uh, you can't see anything. <laughs> okay. So here's the sun. Here's a lot of glazing. Okay, here's our wall. Here, here's the garden area in the front with plants and stuff, food growing, right? There's probably a loft. And the sun comes through here and heats this area up. The air goes up and down. I think I got this going the right way. And now it goes underneath the floor. Yeah. It's a double wall construction. So what is this called? There you go, yes. So I think this is probably a good way to go. I think this is like combining the knowledge of passive house. What is it called? It's called, uh, what do you call it again? I'm sorry. Envelope. Yeah, yeah, envelope houses. Envelope. Yeah, because it's like a double envelope house. Okay. So are you asking, are you strictly passively or a This one? Yeah. It could be either way. Envelope yeah, house. Well, you could use a fan. You know, you could use a fan. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges of this is the building codes don't, don't like it because fire can draft up here. Building officials don't like any, any drafts where the fire can just chase up a wall or something inside. So they typically make you drywall both sides, you know. But you could actually not even do the double wall and just heavily insulate it and have some sort of a fan. And I think would actually even naturally convective loop. There is going to convective loop. One of the challenges with, with these, you could never clean your, your floor. These, these are like taking cinder blocks. Have you guys all seen a cinder block? They're really common. They were laying the cinder blocks down flat so that so the cores were, were, were going all this direction. And they'd put in multiples of them. And they have this air core floor that they could pump out air through. But the challenge with that is how do you clean it? You know, there's going to be spiders and critters hanging out down there eventually. Yeah. Yeah, so that's... 
that's kind of what I think we should be, the direction we should be going, you know. It locks us into kind of a design, you know, but to bring a garden inside a house, this would be a good way to go. The, uh, the challenges with these things are, when you have plants in a house, you have to deal with the humidity, and so it has to be managed by a human that can actually open up a window or a door, and typically Americans these days, they want everything mechanically done for them. Set it and forget it, you know. So, so much so that, that uh, Thorsten is designing this radical system where he can shut his, his, his shutters at night time. Because he's building houses like he built for himself. That was a house he built for himself. Back, uh, back here. He, he's building these things uh, for clients now. And the clients want, they don't want to walk outside when it's 50 below and shut their curtain. So now they have to automate this thing. And who knows what that's going to cost, you know. So they're experimenting with garage door tracks and stuff. Uh, so that's where I'm at in my, my building uh, progress. Well, I took a long, long time to, uh, to get there uh, and learned a lot. And I can tell you some radical mistakes that I, mean, I made, but other builders made. Uh, one of the mistakes is uh, air tightness. You know, air tightness is responsible for like, take, take a guess, how much air leaks out of a, of a house if you don't air tighten it really well? Any well, I guess it's in percent. How much percent? 30%. 30, right on the money. Yeah, so it's 30% of the air. That's 30% carbon footprint, 30% heat bill. 30% is a big number when you're looking at, uh, you know, heat loss and stuff like that. So my feeling was like we, we make these houses as tight as we can get them, and then you have to have a mechanical ventilation system to make them work. And uh, permaculture, maybe, I don't know, you have to somehow power the, the fan. And the reason I'm doing this is because the, house, the houses I've been building have been powered by electricity for the heating system. And when you power something with electricity, it has to be super efficient. Anything you burn, electricity, natural gas, you know, uh, with the exception of firewood, or maybe a solar-powered wood stove. Solar-powered wood stove is like you're burning basically trees that have been photosynthesis by the, by the sun, which is kind of cool. Anyway, um, to make these houses really tight, we would do lots of tape, lots of glue, spend lots of money on adhesives, and we got them super tight, and they work really well, uh, but you have to be on the grid. You have to have the grid set up to do this. And the idea of that was that some places won't let you have a wood stove. This is one of them, Missoula. So large communities can have pollution problems with, when you burn wood. And the Mandans uh, had problems. They were complaining about a lot of eye irritation because their, their, uh, their buildings were, you know, they had the, the Hogan thing. They had a fire pit in the center with a hole in the top and the smoke would filter out, you know. And uh, so, so yeah, we're probably becoming, as a race, a little more, uh, you know, weaker in some ways. These people are pretty, probably pretty tough folks, you know, genetically. Uh, so my clients... I can't see them, you know, getting below 50 degrees in their houses. Uh, so we make this house really airtight. So now we have an HRV. An HRV is a, is, is a word for heat recovery ventilator. But we also have these things called ERVs. So do you guys know what ERV stands for? Yeah, you've done your homework. And you know what the difference is? The energy recovery ventilator uh, has a, a, an enthalpic wheel. And what it does, it recaptures some of the uh, the water vapor that you blast out of the house from the HRV. So to recover the water vapor, you do the ERV. And these work pretty good if you don't have too many people in the building, but these houses are so airtight that you get a big buildup of uh, carbon dioxide and also water vapor. And so you run the ER or ERV off a of control and you can just set it for intermittent or continuous, low speed, continuous high speed. But the beauty of these things are, you can put a filter grill out here and filter your air. So you can sleep really well at night. I've got one in my house, and I notice I sleep, you know, le have, I need less sleep. Is that on the side of the house? Yeah, typically we put them on the side. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty ugly looking. You know, we try and, you know, paint the grill or something. It's true. You could hide it with something. Uh, and then you have to have an exhaust some other place. You know, this would be the exhaust maybe. So, so this is how I handle this type of building, and this is kind of expensive, but you guys are permie people. I think permie people need to burn wood. 
right? Or use a sun. You know, I guess in Missoula, you know, if you did passive solar, you probably wouldn't have to have a lot of supplemental energy. I haven't seen too many passive solar homes in Missoula. There's a few out there, but typically builders build them and they face the windows, you know, to the north because they're in the South Hills. You know, I remember driving up the South Hills to to work and the sun was up. Finally, got above the mountain. That's one of the disadvantage of the South Hills. The mountain's so high, and and you could see everybody's. Uh, uh, you know, all their water heaters were going and all their furnaces were going. So you could see all this steam exhausting out all these roofs from all their, their uh, bee vented, you know, appliances. And I thought, holy cow, look at this. They're probably using a fortune of fuel. Um, so this is the method I'm choosing to do for my clients. But there's another method that does not require you to build so airtight. And that's basically, you know, you, you build a, a standard house and you make it fairly tight because you don't want to suffer that 30%. But I tell you something, this, this, you could do 30%, probably even 40%. And if you parked a, a, a modern, efficient wood stove in here and fired that thing up, there's so much heat and wood, it would heat you up really well. I know this because I was working on a house down in Dillon. And I'm in my little construction trailer, you know, with the heater cranked up. And it's pretty cold out. It's probably zero. And there's an old bunkhouse that happened to be at this job site we're working at. And it's a crazy job site. We're building this little replica of Mayan temple down there for a guy. And anyway, uh, the crew's in this bunkhouse, and he got this, this little heater. And Bruce, being the, the uh, savage guy that he was, he was stumbling around Pacific Steel when he found this piece of pipe uh, that happened to be titanium, I guess. He ground on it. <laughs> Something probably left over from one of the, the mills. They threw out a titanium pipe. I don't know why, but he stuck it up in here. Made him, you know, made himself his own little little stove, just like a, a, a hunting type cook stove. And they had the door wide open. And it was like, you know, 75 degrees, 80 degrees in that little thing with the door open. And I got the door closed and this little heater is cranking in my, my place, my little trailer, and I can hardly stay warm. So that taught me how, my, how much heat is in firewood, you know, made by God, you know. So you kind of, you know, you have to pick your poison when it comes to fuel uh, in this neck of the woods. Now, Something else I was going to talk about to you guys are some, uh, some things that are strange, strange language, like uh, breathable walls. So the, the straw bale people love the word breathable wall, and all walls should breathe, but you shouldn't probably use the word breathe. It should be called vapor open. In other words, you want the water vapor to go through the wall and get out. You don't want to trap water vapor. But you don't want the wall really having air coming through it. One of the problems uh, with, with walls that breathe heavily, like uh, that let air infiltration through it, is over time, maybe not in uh, one generation's time, but maybe in 50 years, the wall gets dirt in there. And that's why the old buildings smell so bad, because the walls have accumulated all this dirt. And we go to remodel them, you tear them apart, and you see all this awful stuff in the fiberglass, whatever they use, or not even any insulation, perhaps. Uh, so we, I would prefer to, you know, call it vapor open wall. And that's kind of what we do in our building trades, the guys that, that know about this. So vapor open. And uh, so we're basically sealing the outside. We like to have the vapor go both ways, but because we're trying to develop an air barrier and we're on a budget, we have to use OSB. We can't use hemp board imported from Germany because it takes too long to, to send it here and too much energy. But Germany has a lot of unique products like hemp. They have autoclave concrete, you know. Our footings in our buildings are solid concrete, right? Well, in Germany, they don't do that. They're actually using an, an insulated concrete that has a slight R value to it. So they're not use, losing a lot of heat to the earth. Which is another thing, uh, another challenge with earth shelters. People think the earth is really warm. Well, it's about 42 degrees at this latitude in the winter. I think it goes up in the 50s maybe even the 60s uh, in the summertime at this latitude. Yeah, now, in Anasazi uh, latitude, Four Corners, they had it perfect. They could use thermal mass really well there. And uh, so <clears throat> thermal mass works in a way where <clears throat> it's kind of cool. It's almost like a solar collector, thermal mass. So what you've got, you've got, got the day here, right? And the sun's out, and this is a mass wall. This is an adobe wall. So it's heat, heating up the wall here. And, and the wall now on this side is becoming hotter than the interior. So the interior got down to 60 or something. Let's say the wall surface temperature is maybe up to 80 because it's direct sun. Because 
The law, the law of physics says heat flows to cold. People says hot air goes up, you know. So heat goes up. Well, yeah, heat goes up because it's lighter than, than denser cold air. But heat energy actually flows towards uh, cold. So the sun is hot and space is cold, right? So the sun's heating this up. Which way is the energy going to go? You know, this, we'll say it's noon. So the energy is headed, headed this way, right, in the wall. It's going, oh, I'm going to go for, the, for this because this is pretty cool, you know. So it's starting to go that way. But all of a sudden the sun goes down. Now some of this energy is in here. We'll say now this is at 70. And all of a sudden now we'll say we're, we're dropping down to, we'll say, 45. Now what happens? This, this guy turns around and he, he's, he's headed out. So the trick to doing this, and Thorsten knows about this in Alaska, the trick to doing this is to make this wall big enough to where this guy never gets outside. In other words, the heat energy is not going to go back out by the time the sun comes up again the next day. Of course, you've got to have the sun come up every day to do this. I mean, Missoula has our wonderful, you know, uh, cloudy days inversions. What's so, thickness? thickness? Yeah. How thick is it? <clears throat> you know, it depends upon the material you're using. Um, I was using Adobe and the Anasazi as an example. i have never been to see their, their ruins, but... Uh, you know, they probably had it dialed in, but I can tell you what, what Thorsten's using. And Thorsten's using dense pack cellulose. And uh, that's called a kind of a medium wa mass wall. First, you have three different walls. You would have a high mass wall, high mass, and that would be adobe or concrete. You know, you have a medium mass, and that's going to be uh, dense pack cellulose. Um, some of the autoclave or lightweight concretes and maybe log construction, medium mass. And you have low mass. Low mass would be spray polyurethane foams, uh, maybe a uh, fiberglass insulation, definitely fiberglass insulation. And so what they're finding out is that, that these medium mass walls are working really well because to answer your question, Thorsten's wall is two feet thick. And at two feet thick, you're, with the cellulose that dense, you're approaching uh, R100, R90. He said it's so thick, he could probably lose his little daughter in the wall. <laughs> that question. But does the moisture get out? The heat doesn't manage it, but does Well, you have to make them vapor open. You know, we used to build to this standard called Super Good Sense. And they said, if this is the inside here, this is in, and this is exterior. They say, put a vapor barrier plastic on that wall, you know, and, and uh, make it so the water vapor can't penetrate. Which brings us up to a, another thing, the climate. This is climate uh, conducive, or climate dependent. So the climate, you know, whether you're in, you know, if you build something, where's the other deal here? I'm looking for this. Anyway, I can just draw on this. I don't need that. Anyway, so if you're in, like in New Orleans, so, so where's the vapor pressure there? The vapor pressure, I mean, is higher pressure and lower pressure. You have a higher vapor pressure on one side of the building and a lower vapor pressure on the other side of the building. In other words, inside, in this climate, we typically have a higher vapor pressure in the wintertime because the outside's pretty cold, especially if it's minus 20. There isn't much vapor out there at all. Well, you can imagine Alaska at minus 50, uh, and that's Thorsten's next thing is trying to or healthy by bringing plants into the building. But if you're going to New Orleans, the vapor pressure is on the outside of the building. So if you were to put this, this vapor barrier on the inside, like the FEMA trailers had, and it's our air conditioning's puppy, the vapor pressure is coming in from the outside, it hits, hits this cold surface, what happens? It condenses. Is that because of Well, it's because of the, uh, the high humidity outside affected by the ocean weather. Mm -hmm. So it condenses into water vapor, I mean from water vapor into liquid. Then what happens? Mold. Mold. Yeah, yeah. And so they designed these trailers for Canada. So we have to really think about where we're building, you know, and even elevation wise. There was a guy to tell us some builders horror stories. My, uh, you know, I like to use these building scientist guys to, to, uh, to help me with my buildings, and they come up, they show up with the infrared cameras, and they got blower doors going. They test for air tightness and look at the heat loss, you know. Well, I get to hear all their horror stories. So, my friend Gary was going to go up to uh, Big Sky, uh, this fancy, you know, uh, big development up there, and, 
He says they spend more money on, this, on the entry than most people's house. So it goes up to this great big log house, log and stick frame thing. And this is a 6,500 feet elevation. And, he's, and he brought two blower doors with him because you know it's going to be leaky. Typically, you just, you just use one blower door. So he's got two blower doors running. He looks at the homeowner and the crew and he says, hey, you left the door open or window someplace. I can't get this thing depressurized to even get a reading. So we should go through and, and look at this, you know, again, to see if everything's closed up. Well, everything was closed up. So Gary, sa Gary says, well, I'm basically blower door testing the outdoors. You can't keep heat in, heat in here. It's all leaking out. Well, the homeowners, they're so wealthy, they don't mind the, uh, the $17,000 a year heat bill for the propane company. But what the homeowner was very really upset about was comfort. They forgot. He forgot that, that comfort was a function of a, of a nice energy efficient building. So if the building's leaking lots of air and everybody knows about drafts because we've experienced them, you're not comfortable. So one of the advantages to having a, a real thick wall, I learned in my, in my uh, <clears throat> building, and I'm doing double, double stud walls, I should draw this. I built a two by four wall here. We'll say this is the outside now, I'll reverse it. And then I'll measure in, I used to do 12 inches, right? And put, it, put cellulose in that. So, well, let, let's jump up to 16 inches. Now I'm going to 18 inches. <laughs> but I have built a 16 inch version <clears throat> with insulation. And what we learned from this was that working in the house as carpenters, we're down to our t-shirts and we're, and we're dying at 68 degrees. So man, set the thermostat down, you know, this in the winter, obviously. So we set it down to, to 66 degrees and we're still too hot. Holy cow! You know, so what we, we dropped it all the way down to 64 degrees and we could actually feel comfortable moving around. And the reason why that is, is because if you have this wall at R70, <clears throat> compared like standard stick frame construction, I think is R20 to 24, we'll say. <clears throat> This wall surface is much warmer than, than our 24 wall surface in the winter time. So remember, heat flows to cold, and when you, stand, when you stand in front of a cold window and you feel the cold on your face, it's not the cold coming in to get you, it's your, your face losing so much energy that you're feeling cold. So because your body is losing less energy to, to this wall, because you're, you're hotter than this wall, <clears throat> Hopefully, <laughs> and you're using you're losing more energy to this wall. So because of that, we were actually able to, to drop that thermostat down way below than what our setting was on other homes. So, and by dropping the thermostat down so far, it saves a huge amount of energy. Just dropping at one degree is, is big time in energy savings. Here, we're using cellulose dense pack. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, it's made from ground up. Newspapers typically. When we put a dense pack, is that, is that like, like the, the, the pillow looking things? Or yeah. Pillow? Yeah, well, well both. Uh, it shows up as a pillow looking things, and they, they cut the bags open and put them in a, in a machine that grinds it up and pumps it into the building. And what they do, they staple this netting on the, on the side of the stud, right? And they staple it with these roof staples about every, it's just like you're, you're stitching up like a sewing machine. The staples are only maybe a half inch apart. <clears throat> And, it, and this, this netting has like a fiberglass reinforcing mesh in it, like, like this, and it makes it real tight like, like a drum. You can hit it, you know. And then they cut slits in it, put their hose in there, and then turn their, their blower on a certain speed and start filling it all full. And I thought, well, how are they getting this stuff dense enough? I think it's supposed to be like four pounds per cubic foot is what they're shooting for. Or maybe seven, I don't remember. But anyway, I was curious to know how they're gonna make this dense enough so it doesn't saddle. Settling is a, re a real problem, the stuff getting pushed down by its own weight. And so what they did after they filled the wall, they put on a smart hose, made an adjustment to their blower on their machine, and the house is all full of dust. This is terrible to be in there, but I want to find out what they're doing anyway. <clears throat> cut, they, then they cut a hole. They would cut holes every four feet. They came back and they cut a hole between all the holes, so they had a hole every two feet. And they would just pump this full until that plastic started expanding out to the face of the stud because they're stapling the plastic to the side of the stud, so the plastic is inset by about three quarters of an inch. So as it pushes it out, so it's flush with the stud on the inside, then they know they've got around four pounds uh, per cubic foot. And uh, that works really well. That, this is, this is the, a great system because it's, it's cheap, 
and it doesn't use a lot of resources. You're using two by fours, which are small trees, you know. And uh, so this is what I like. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, they, I'll, I'll tell these guys at Lumberyard, yeah, I need you know, a bazillion 2 by 4s and the guy will tell me myself and say, Terry, I thought you were the energy efficient builder. What are you doing using 2 by 4s And says, well, Paul, I'm, I'm actually building two walls and I'm putting them 16 inches apart. And he goes, oh, <laughs> okay. So, um, <clears throat> you know, when it's, that, when it's that deep, 16 inches, it just doesn't matter. Because it's, this is 3.5 and, and that's 3.5, and so that's, that's 7 total. And so you have 11 inches of cellulose between the studs. So he's making a good point. Do you guys know what a thermal bridge is? Thermal bridge is like when you touch your tongue to a cold, uh, you know, frozen pole outside as a kid. <laughs> anyway, a thermal bridge is, is a stud. <clears throat> and you can typically see them uh, in the wintertime on houses. You'll see lines, especially on roofs. Roofs show this up, you know, day in, day out in the wintertime as thermal bridges. <clears throat> and. Uh, Passive house is real strict about thermal bridging. In fact, when they look at their windows and their program, they're looking at the center, they're looking at the glass, uh, R value. They're also, you go by U values and metric. They're also looking at the warm edge spacer that holds the glass together, and they're also looking at the frame. All this is put in their program. Their windows are much different. Their windows are, are in the center of the wall. And this is something you guys should do if you're ever building uh, houses. You know, we typically put all of our windows, I'll draw a typical American, the wall is much thinner, and our windows are on the outside of the building. Here's the outside. The Europeans, they're doing center windows. And when they shoot this with their infrared cameras, there's a huge amount of difference. This is 20% better just by putting the window inside. And this is where science can really help. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they, they, you, have to, you have to build this, you have to frame like a, a window sill out of some material. You have to do it, like a lot of people use steel, you know, to do this. And then what they're doing on their window is say if this is the frame up here, can you guys see that little X? Anyway, they're, they're bringing something like, like foam or some sort of insulation around the edge and actually insulating that frame right there. And their frames are really thick. Their windows are different. They're tilt turns. So you can activate the latch and, and the window hinges in, or you shut it and throw the latch a different position, and the window will, will tilt in at the top. <clears throat> but the windows, there's a guy in, in town here that's built this Germanic looking house that <clears throat> everybody's mad at him in the neighborhood, <clears throat> I guess, so I've been told. But he spent over $100,000 on his passive house windows. <clears throat> and so you can do anything with a lot of money, but that's not what we're trying to achieve. <clears throat> We're trying to achieve sustainability and permaculture. So I'm just showing you what I have to deal with <clears throat> with some of these clients, you know. So. Why wouldn't it be beneficial to put the window on the inside? On the inside? <clears throat> you know, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> something about the way the heat flows, and they, they do it with inf infrared, so there's all these different colors. You know, you got blues and reds. <clears throat> blues being uh, more heat loss. And, but, but the infrared camera picture looks something like, like this, you know. <clears throat> so, yeah. That's, that's pretty much a passive house. Uh, what, what else do you guys want me to talk about? Anything unique? I don't know if I really covered good permaculture items. Uh, Skeeter, what do you think? Should I should. Do, uh, have you ever done anything with straw or with, uh, with the earth and stuff? Or are you just picking you know, Yeah, yeah. Things, now we can talk about <clears throat> uh, my passion. Because, yeah, with a name like Natural House Builders, you think this guy would use something else besides cellulose and foam, right? <laughs> So yeah, straw bale. And Scott and I worked on a straw bale together uh, down in Florence last summer. And uh, that was a fun project. It turned out really well. <clears throat> it was a good, good project. To do it as a professional contractor, it gets very expensive to do straw bale. I would really recommend a workshop and get a bunch of people together for not only stacking the straw, but also stuccoing. Because <clears throat> the straw was, was, was big time on the cost at the end of the building um, as a professional contractor. Is there a special kind of straw you have to use? <clears throat> yeah, what did we use? Did we use uh, barley? Oats. Oats? I think it was, I don't know, I think it was barley. Okay. Wheat mm -hmm. straw, uh, wheat straw holds up. If you can get wheat straw out of the three main grains. Okay, cool. Some people have access to rice straw. <clears throat> you know, uh, Oak Ridge Laboratory did a R value test. Do you guys know about R values? 
<clears throat> you know, R is resistance to heat flow. <clears throat> I think our code is about, for walls, it's like R21 or 24. <clears throat> I don't even know because I built so far beyond code, I can't remember what their little R value is now. Do you know the units? What's that? The units. The U value? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, U value is like BTUs per square foot per hour uh, per, te per degree. That, that's kind of, that's what a U value is for like windows and doors. And so the U is the reciprocal of the R. So like one divided by the U uh, is that. And then and the R divided, R divided by, uh, well, one divided by the R is the U. <clears throat> so that's how that works for U values. And Europeans are into K values, which is metric. <clears throat> so you have to convert. It's a real hassle. But what about geodesic? Like geodesic domes? Yeah, like Buck, kind of Right, Bucky, Bucky domes, yeah. <clears throat> so those, I've seen a few of those, and those are unique because they have an interesting energy flow. Yeah. The energy flows in those things so fast. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and sound, you could stand in one spot, and there was like a joke, uh, you know, a blacked out, uh, you know, joke. Uh, paper and two little eyes and it says, Mommy, how come I can hear everybody in this in my in my bedroom? And it's because the sound will reflect that same point. <clears throat> you know. So those are some disadvantages. Also, are you a drywaller by trade? The reason I ask is because drywall is square and geodesic domes are not square. I mean you would throw a lot of stuff away. <clears throat> yeah. They're talking about putting them in Florida for a hurricane because the wind goes around it instead of uh, blowing it over. Yeah, yeah. That would be so probably a good thing. Good, certain areas of the, having that round. Mm -hmm. But the structure, the geodesic stone, is supposed to like really be super strong. They're very strong because it's an arch. You, you push down on them. You wouldn't want, wouldn't want to push out on them, but pushing down on them, they're, they're very strong. Yeah, so there's advantages or disadvantages. Hanging drywall, not so efficient. <clears throat> you know, um, you'd have to have it engineered. I would say tornado, country, Mm, maybe move. No, no. I would say a, <laughs> I would say a concrete home, a concrete home. And what they do, they they build these ICF houses. <clears throat> okay, ICF is insulated concrete forms. So we have these. Have you guys seen these? I'm sure you have. There's like a tie in here. <clears throat> and this is this is the evil oil. This this is foam of some kind. And they stack together like Legos. <clears throat> and they're all wiggly. And then we we have to brace them. And they're up on top with a great big boom pump and watching concrete go down inside them, you know. And they're pretty good. They're, for uh, strength, they're very good. <clears throat> and so what they do on the top of the wall uh, in hurricane country, they have this steel strap that you actually cast in, in, into the cement and the strap bends over and nails down the side, side of, the, of the truss. <clears throat> Here's a roof, rafter coming down and you nail the daylights out of this. You maybe put in, who knows, as many nails as you can fit in there. <clears throat> and there's been guys who have there's been articles I've seen online from ICF companies trying to promote their product of a hurricane coming through a, a, a town, I don't know where, Kansas or someplace, and the guy's gone and is, is just his little daughter in center home alone, and he finds out a tornado went through the town, and he comes, comes home, and the only thing wrecked is like there's a piece of fascia off, off this. The neighbor's house is gone, but the only thing wrong is like he's, he's lost, I think, a little bit of roofing and a fascia, and his, his uh, tree in the front of his house is, is ripped in half. And he's freaked out because his kids aren't there. But the kids actually were, were picked up by somebody. And the kids spent the, uh, the, you know, they spent the tornado time in the house. They said their ears popped really bad, you know. And they went down the basement or something. But they were fine. So yeah, so this, in certain countries, this is a good way to go. Uh, if I was in Tornado Alley, I would definitely be having something like this or or maybe some sort of fast sports car where I could get the heck out of there quick. <laughs> yeah. Which brings to a point, you know, uh, earth changes. You know, um, we're seeing a lot more activity in the earth these days and more weird, weird weather. And, you know, I don't know if we can build for some of these things. But one thing I would not want to do is build for somebody right in the ocean. So that's basically common sense. We're in the mountains. We're pretty safe here. Forest fires. You know, we probably got what is it, 70% snowpack this year, so we're probably going to see a bunch of forest fires this fall. So I would not build way up on the timber. Uh, if you did build maybe one of these houses, but I did see a house where somebody did an ICF. It wasn't, 
it was like a, a block that was a <coughs> rostra. You guys know about that one? That was a real green type of block, kind of an aerated concrete, uh, and then you fill it full of, you know, uh, heavy six sack, six bags of cement per cubic yard mix, <coughs> like they use normally. And this was a log house that, that actually burned in one of the fires down by uh, Sula. And this was all, even the ICF was burned into quite a ways. All there was left was just the ICFs and concrete. <coughs> Nothing else around. So, so basically, if you go to Hawaii and see rock on fire, you realize everything burns at some temperature. Yeah, right. <coughs> but yeah, it's all kind of common sense. And the old timers knew this. If you looked at the houses in the Bitterroot Valley, they lived close to the old main, the Meridian Roads, which are basically the main highway up and down the valley. So if somebody got sick or if they were, they were going to have a baby, they had close access to the road. <coughs> and they would, you know, face their houses away from major windstorms coming out of the west or something. It's only, a, it's only been, you know, when we discovered <coughs> uh, that we could put furnaces in houses and, and you know, uh, just run the thermostat whatever temperature we wanted, we'd forgot about the sun. But the real answer is, is in the sun. The sun is going to give us all the answers we need to heat our houses in the future. So that concludes my presentation. Any more questions?